Monaco, or Monaco if you've played F1 Challenge. You know that posh voice that does the intros before every race and then reads out the grid? Welcome to Monaco. The weather, as is off. It's a massive throwback to the F1 Challenge playthrough I did, what, five years ago now? Ah, those were the days. I killed him off at the Austrian Grand Prix, and then the new announcer was a drug smuggler. Then he read Fifty Shades of Grey, then he joined a rap crew, and then he went AWOL in Japan to do Downhill 2 Gracing. Is there anybody watching today that was around for that series? Yeah, once upon a time I wasn't the Storytime guy. Weird, I know. Anyway, Monaco, F1's crown jewel event. While it's often a snooze fest and mainly caters to the celebrities, influencers and actual royalty of the world, it's also a place that has had a few races that have been the ones to turn up in the montages and list videos released every year in the lead up to the Monaco Grand Prix. And I've done some of them here. 1996 when Panis won with a no fuel stop strategy, 1955 when Ascari went for a dip in the harbour, and 1967 when Lorenzo Bandini had the circuit's only fatal accident when he crashed at the Harbour Front Chicane, the same place where Ascari crashed. But being a late 60s Formula 1 car, it burst into flames and caused injuries that were not survivable, and the race just carried on around his burning car. But for this one, it involves rain. A lot of rain. And it actually changed the outcome of the championship given how the point structures worked. For this, we're in 1984, the year, not the book that everybody claims to have read but actually hasn't. F1 is in the midst of its first turbo era, and while the numbers being pumped out by the engines hadn't quite reached the mythical four figures that are often quoted on the internet and somehow increased by about 50 horsepower every 10 years, the cars were still pretty powerful. And while we're here, we might as well get straight onto it and say that the numbers that are often quoted on the internet aren't the numbers they would have run all the time. At this point, turbos were completely unrestricted, but the FIA had mandated a 220 litre maximum tank, because also in this year, refuelling pioneered by Brabham had been outlawed. The 220 litre tank did a couple of things. Number one was that it made the car heavier and therefore slower. And number two, the higher the engine power output, the more fuel the car used. So the amount of fuel being limited to what it was forced the teams to turn the boost down in the races to make sure they made the end. So yeah, even in the 1980s, Formula One was a fuel saving exercise. So really those cars were only running those insane engine power outputs in qualifying. According to online sources, starting with a W and ending in Wikipedia, the tag Porsche engine in the McLaren could put out anywhere between 660 and 860 horsepower in the race, and up to 960 in qualifying. Still a lot of power for a car that weighed around 550 kilos, or 1,200 pounds. That same McLaren was being driven by Alain Prost and Nicky Lauda. The MP42 is one of the most dominant Formula 1 cars ever built, and it had won probably about two or three of the opening five races, but weirdly hadn't been on pole in any of them. The Monaco Grand Prix was to be the sixth round of that season, held in the early June of 1984. After the previous round in Dijon, won by Lauda, Prost led the championship standings by six points. Behind the two McLarens was Derek Warwick in the Renault, followed by Rene Arnoux's Ferrari and Elio de Angelis in the Lotus. I need to cover the 1984 season in full because the MP42 of that year had some bits and bobs on it that set it apart from the rest of the field, and it was also a very successful car. It resulted in Prost and Lauda having the closest season in F1 history. But just for today, we'll just stick with what happened at Monaco. In a case of some sort of foreshadowing, maybe, of what was to come, in qualifying, Martin Brunel suffered a massive crash on the exit of Tabak Corner when he slammed into the wall and rolled his Tyrrell. As was the case at the time, and also because Monaco is so tightly packed, Brundle was able to quickly get back to the pits and jump in the spare car that most, if not all, the teams had, just in case you know one of them was written off or upgrades didn't work as planned so they could revert pretty quickly. He was about to get into the spare Tyrrell when he suddenly realised he had no recollection of how he got back to the pit lane. Sid Watkins told Martin that he was done for the weekend. This might just be anecdotal, but Sid basically had three questions he would ask to a driver who had come back to the pits and was a bit shaken about. He'd ask them what their name was, where they were, and what the date was. If you couldn't answer any of those three questions, you were parked. After the two qualifying sessions, it was Prost on pole. The first time he was on pole in a McLaren, and it was McLaren's first pole of the season. He was less than a tenth ahead of Mansell's Lotus, and he utterly blitzed his more experienced teammate Lauda by over a second. If that had happened today, there'd be people on Twitter who make supporting a driver their entire personality calling Nicky washed. At the back of the grid was the only Tyrrell that made it onto the grid, driven by a young, hot shot and maybe equally hot-headed German called Stefan Berloff. he just made it onto the grid ahead of Mark Schurer's arrows, and 20 drivers would start the grid at the expense of Schurer, Brundle, Cheever, Bootsen, Palmer, Baldi and Alio. Now, the RAM team. 
They were on the grid between 1976 and 1985. Never heard of them. Race day, however, was looking a bit grim. It had rained early in the morning, which, okay, is fine. That happens, and weather forecasting wasn't like it is today with all the radars and stuff that the teams have on hand, where they could tell a driver that it's going to rain in 10 minutes or whatever, only for it to not. Either way, that shower turned into a full-on deluge that soaked the track, and being a driver hella keen on driver safety, Nicky Lauda went to Bernie to exercise some concerns. Nicky's issue was the one unique part about the track, the tunnel. The rest of the track was soaked and the tunnel was bone dry, and with the wet tyres on they were just going to overheat in there. On top of this, the historic race that had run the previous day had seen cars dump oil in there, and the combination of the oil and wet tyres on the dry track meant that the cars were going to be spinning out their wheels in fifth gear, which is suboptimal. Bernie said leave it with me and he called the local fire brigade who went into the tunnel and just sprayed water everywhere to make sure that the track was at least damp everywhere. The race start was delayed by 45 minutes. This is 1984 and this is when drivers were real men and got on with it apparently, but it just shows that some things don't really change. But when the race got going, Prost led into the first corner while behind there was a bit of chaos, as Arnu and Warwick got tangled and were taken off to the outside of Sam de Vaud, where they were collected by the other Renault of Tombe. Both Arnu and Warwick sustained leg injuries. Warwick was bruised but Arnu had broken his leg when the suspension arm came in through the cockpit. This is the days before the FIA said that the driver's feet had to be behind the front axle. This would change after 1986 when Jacques Lafitte both broke of his legs and ended his Formula 1 career at Brands Hatch. However, Prost wasn't having it entirely his own way. Nigel Mansell in the Lotus was catching up and the man with racing's greatest moustache overtook the McLaren on lap 9, resulting in Nigel leading a Grand Prix for the first time. Nigel had overtaken Prost when he was held up by a bat marker and once Mansell had cleared Alan, he was off. Four laps later, he was seven seconds ahead. Nigel was in, if in doubt, flat out mode a la Colin McRae, while Prost was most likely taking it easy, full professor mode. While Prost and Mansell were out front, there were a couple of young drivers on the grid that were putting on a show for everybody that was braving the storm. Do we call it a storm? Yeah, it was a full on storm. Prost and Mansell were leading, but some of the other experienced drivers had gone off the road. Coming through the field were two young drivers, Stefan Beloff and a young Brazilian kid called De Silva? Ayrton Senna De Silva was driving for the Tolman team, a team that is still in F1 today. Uh, sort of. It became Benetton, then Renault, then Lotus, then Renault again, and now it's Alpine. They joined Formula 1 in 1981, and in the years they'd been on the grid, they'd not been exactly setting the world on fire. A mess of non-qualifications in their debut season, but had broken the top 10 on a couple of occasions, before Derek Warwick scored a handful of points for them in 1983. That performance was rewarded with his 1984 move to Renault. Senna had already scored a 6th place at Kyle and Zolda, but then didn't qualify at San Marino. But while everybody makes a big deal about Senna being in the car that year, we shouldn't sleep on the fact that his teammate for 3 quarters of the season was MotoGP champion of 1975, Johnny Ciccato. Senna had started the race in 13th. By lap 15 he was up to 4th, staying on the track while others around him, including the experienced Arnu, Rosberg and Lauda, had had some sort of issue. That's not a, he only got by because, by the way. But the thing is, Senna wasn't driving like a rookie in his sixth ever Formula 1 race. He was driving like he'd been there for about 10 or 15 years and he was somehow finding grip where the more experienced guys who had won championships before him couldn't. Now while Senna was a massive talent and I'm not going to say otherwise, he may have had some assistance from the fact that in 1984, Tolman was running Hart engines that wouldn't have had the same amount of power and torque that the top engines of the time would have had. Senna wasn't having the same amount of issues that the other cars would have had putting power down, yet at the same time aerodynamically and mechanically that car would have been down as well. Basically what I'm trying to say here is that rain is the great equaliser, so while the, everything had been equalised because of the rain, Senna was still using his talent to get that car up through the field, if you follow me here. Also apparently Brian Hart who made the engines for Tolman that year and Tony Hart were brothers. Tony Hart as in kids TV presenter Tony Hart, Morph and all that other stuff, which is you know, starting to show my age a little bit. Everybody outside of the UK and or under the age of 30 is probably looking at their screens and going, what the fuck is Morph? Either way, Senna was doing stuff that should have been done by a front-running car, but behind him, Beloff was also doing stuff that was beyond belief as well. Remember, as well as the fact that the Tyrrell was the slowest car on the grid, Beloff was in the only non-turbo car. He jumped from 20th to 10th in 3 laps and was rising up through the field, gaining one notable freebie when Mansell dropped the car on a white line and spun off. 
This put Prost back into the lead from Lauda, and Prost was over half a minute ahead, but both McLarens were struggling. The McLarens had carbon brakes, one of the first Formula 1 cars to utilise them while everybody else was using steel brakes. These carbon brakes didn't work particularly well in hot, dry conditions, or in the wet, or at street circuits. So at a wet street circuit, they were probably going to be in it sooner or later. The cars would have had this deficit shown at places like Dallas and Detroit later in the season, as the steel brakes worked better than the carbon ones did. The McLaren's superior fuel economy versus the rest of the grid allowed them to run the engine at higher power for longer, which was a big advantage for them. On top of this, Prost's engine was misfiring and his brakes were starting to get a bit iffy as well. Lauda himself was out of the race when he locked the rears going into Casino Square. So Prost's issues with the engine and the brakes allowed Senna to utterly monch through the gap. Such was the level Prost had slowed down, he was losing 2-3 to three seconds to Senna a lap and Beloff was closing in faster still. Senna showed his intent to Prost and everybody else by putting in the fastest lap on lap 24. And in addition, the rain was easing off. Soon, Prost would be a sitting duck. But while the rain was easing, the track was still utterly soaked. On lap 29, Prost started pointing to the sky every time he passed the start line to indicate to the bosses that this wasn't good enough and the conditions were too bad. On the next lap, he did it again, and again, and again. On lap 32, the officials dropped the red and checkered flag at the same time to indicate that the race was over. Senna passed the McLaren and went for another lap, thinking that because he'd passed Prost before the line and crossed the line ahead, he'd won his first Grand Prix and only his fifth start because he'd not qualified at Imola. But this is why Prost is called the Professor. He knew that the race results would be taken from the last complete lap, which was lap 31, which Prost was leading. It pays to know the rules sometimes. It's an ending that's still contentious to this day. A lot of Senna fans 40 years later, and it will be 40 years this year, where has the time gone, even though I wasn't born until 1990, but that's something else entirely. A lot of Senna fans are still convinced that Senna was robbed. But while a lot of people will be keen to retort to all of that with, no, you and Senna don't know how the rulebook works, there are things that actually do feed the conspiracy to the point where you go, oh, actually, it could have been a robbery. The clerk of the course that day was Jacques Bernard Edmond Martin Henri X, former F1 driver and Monsieur Le Mans. Well, before Christensen came along, obviously. At the time, X was a factory driver with Porsche, along with Beloff, as it so happens. And X is also Belgian, which has close ties with France. And X was working for the French FIA. The engines in the back of those McLarens? Well, they were Porsches. So there is this whole conspiracy that... X, who's Belgian, which has close ties to France, was helping the French guy win the Grand Prix at the expense of the rookie because they couldn't have a rookie win at Monaco in an inferior car now, could they? It just... It, it, actually, it wouldn't have mattered. The whole thing wouldn't have mattered. And here's why. So the track was drying. Senna was faster. They should have carried it on. They should have let it run to full distance and Senna probably would have won. But because the race was abandoned, Senna was robbed. That's usually the argument, but there is one thing that gets overlooked that puts an X to doubt on those claims. A couple of laps before X threw the red to help his mate out, Keck, Senna had absolutely obliterated the curbs at the chicane by the waterfront. Now back then, the curbs were... curbs, like the ones you find out the front of your house that separates the pavement from the road. Using them was suboptimal, and when the cars got back to the pits, the Tolman mechanics and engineers, two of which were Pat Simmons and Rory Byrne, discovered that the suspension had been quite badly damaged in the impact with those curbs, and the car would only have lasted another four laps. If that. It makes you wonder how long Prost would have lasted as well, because Lauda was already out with brake failure, well at least grabbing the brakes too hard, locking them and then spinning off at Casino Square, but Prost was suffering from brake issues and engine issues. If both of those cars had gone off and retired, there's every possibility that Beloff could have won that race. While Senna had put on quite the show, Motorsport Magazine had attributed it to luck as well as skill that had got him there. Again, this isn't detracting from what he achieved that day. He was given the opportunities and he took them and they almost paid off. Almost. Prost was very, very clever that day, you'd think, but it would also be his undoing later on in the season. The original classified results stated that Prost won the race from Senna, while Beloff's Tyrrell was classified third. Beloff, in the only naturally aspirated car on the grid, had gone from last to third, and had been closing up to Senna faster than Senna had been catching up to Prost. Like Senna though, Beloff had managed to stay out of trouble and had managed to take advantage of De Cesaris, Tombe, Warwick, Piquet, Winkelhock, Lauda and Patrese all coming a cropper at some point. Only eight drivers finished. Prost, Senna, Beloff, Arnoux, Rosberg, De Angelis, Alboreto, Ginzani, and Lafitte. 
Berloff, however, was later disqualified from the race and Tyrrell's results expunged from the 1984 results for being what I've labelled in the past as the world's fastest shotgun, basically topping the car up with lead shot to bring it up to weight as their engines were lighter than the turbos. But either way, this race announced the arrivals of Senna and Berloff as future stars. Berloff though would never reach his full potential. He was killed at Spa in an endurance race the following year where he collided with, ironically, Ix. Senna would become one of the biggest commodities in Formula 1 and racing as a whole. Journalists at the time said he might not have won this particular race but his time would come and two more podiums that year would add to that expectation rather than a prediction that he would do big things in a Formula 1 car. Senna, Prost and controversy. Is there a better combo in Formula 1? So then, a look at the contentious Monaco Grand Prix of 1984. If this has explained a part of motorsport history you didn't know much about, then do like the video so I know I've done a good job. And for more like this, get subscribed with the bell on so you'll be notified when I do anything else here. Massive thanks as ever to the rad lads at Patreon for the continued support. And if you want to help support the channel at a more personal level, there is a link to Patreon in the description, along with links to Discord, socials and other bits and pieces, like my affiliate links with the F1 store and Mix Garage. Well, super thanks for the one and done donations and memberships if you just want to spam Roberto Moreno emojis in the comments. So until next time, I've been Aidan Millward, have a great day wherever you are, and goodbye.